Amarillo, Texas, as Mike Scroggins is just oh, one game and one win away from capturing this season's PBA Player of the Year honor, but it's a loaded field that wants to play the role of spoiler. It's been one of the most memorable seasons in the history of the PBA Tour. A woman beat the big boys. A former auto worker captured a major championship. And an amateur took down the world's best. Today, the Tour makes its last stop of the season with one of its most challenging events, the Lumber Liquidators Marathon Open. Who will survive this week-long test of strength and stamina? And who will ultimately be crowned this season's PBA Player of the Year? Walter Ray Williams Jr. or that man, Mike Scroggins? Find out with us next. We welcome you this Easter afternoon to Baltimore, Maryland for the final event of this season's PBA Tour. It's been a marathon and not a sprint all week long here. 53 games on seven different oil patterns over five days have weeded the field to five. Today's Lumber Liquidators Marathon Open Final Five includes a Hall of Famer, two former Player of the Year, and this year's potential PBA Player of the Year. And glad you're with us today. I'm Rob Stone. And today we put the wraps on not only a tournament, but really a complete season that tested the versatility and endurance of the world's best bowlers. And the bowling gods truly did smile on us today. The final match of the final tournament of the season will determine this year's PBA Player of the Year. Your top seed, Mike Scroggins, with the victory, would vault over Bill O'Neill and Walter Ray Williams Jr. and earn his first ever Player of the Year title. Number two seed, Pete Weber, looking for his 35th tour title. Chris Barnes, three times a runner-up this season, seeks his first title of the campaign, as does Brad Angelo and the reigning, for now at least, Player of the Year, Wes Malott. Top seed Mike Scroggins put himself in the player of the year race courtesy of a strong second half of the season which was kicked off by his victory at the Pepsi Red, White and Blue Open in Wichita. He then finished fourth at the Masters, second at the U.S. Open and one in Columbus, Ohio. His guaranteed at worst second place finish today has him in a current three-way tie for player of the year honors. The first tiebreaker goes to Walter Ray Williams Jr., which means Scroggins must win today if he wants the Player of the Year honor. And Randy Peterson standing by with our top seed right now. Mike, describe what winning Player of the Year would mean to you. Oh, man, that's uh, beyond my expectations. I mean, uh, just to have a chance at it this year. You know, the last two years I've uh, been close, but this year it comes down to one game. Uh, it's probably one of my biggest games I've ever bowled in my life. So with all the pressure on the line today, how do you get into your zen? How do you mentally get your body to perform at the highest level? Well, for starters, uh, seeing my ball hook off the gutter would be really good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just uh, try to take one shot at a time and concentrate on every shot. And if I make 10 good shots and still lose, I'll be happy with that. But uh, if I, may, I feel like if I make 10 good shots, I should win. Rob, Mike Scroggins got the biggest bowling game of his life coming up. And we're looking for it. Mike Scroggins will be waiting in the wings, Randy, for the title match. Who will he face? Match number one, Wes Malott versus Brad Angelo, the winner to take on Chris Barnes. And there's Pete Weber. Had a huge 300 game late yesterday to vault himself up into that number two seed spot. The winner of that one, match three, to take on Mike Scroggins. Time now for the introductions of match number one. And we begin with the reigning player of the year, Wes Malott. A six-time winner on the PBA Tour, the reigning PBA Player of the Year and undisputed king of bowling from Pflugerville, Texas. Please welcome Wes Malott. Wes, not only the reigning Player of the Year, also the reigning winner of this tournament. who won the Atonic Marathon Open last season when it was held in Indianapolis. Beat Ronnie Russell, 248-195 for that title. An opening strike for the Big Nasty. 
Uh, and last year, he, he chose the Scorpion oil pattern, and that's one of the privileges of the tournament we get in this event. And we know that West Malott's the Scorpion King. Absolutely. A two-time member of Team USA, he won the Viper Championship last season, a former PBA Tour Rookie of the Year from Lockport, New York. Please welcome Brad Angelo. So Brad, his first television appearance this season. This will be the best finish to date for him, his eighth top 20 finish, his fourth top 10 of the season. Drop and in fact, Brad was doing some early adjustments to his ball as well. Yeah, he was working that thumb pretty good, changing that grip out a couple of times, making sure he had the perfect feel. But, you know, I, I, Brad has had a real tough season. In fact, this is the worst season he's had since he's been on this tour. And, you know, right now, a win would bode well for Brad and really helping out a dismal year. Uh, we asked him yesterday what a win would equal. He said, well, it would cap off a horrible season, far and away the worst season I've ever had since being a pro, worse across the board. And this is a tough tournament to excel at. All the different oil patterns thrown at you over the course of five days, all these games, the cuts, 53 games, five days. They concluded on the Dick Weber oil pattern yesterday, which is the pattern that your top seed, Mike Scroggins, selected to be used today in the finals. And, and Rob, I think you said it best in the open when you, when you touched on endurance and versatility because, let's face it, you bowl 53 games in five days over seven different oil patterns. You better have endurance and versatility. And a little luck wouldn't hurt either. First frame, Brad Angelo leaves a shaker four and he comes back with a solid eight. And again, you know, why kick a guy when he's down? I mean, has he not gone through enough this season? Throws a great shot there. You see the eight pin, the last pin on the deck but it certainly doesn't hurt to get some breaks as well. It's telling us how tough it is on him to be here today on Easter, a very important day for he and his family, and clearly his thoughts of his daughters and his wife on his mind right now. So back-to-back -back spares for Brad Angelo. Time now for our Lumber Liquidators. Know the wood, Randy. Well, it's the Dick Weber oil pattern. And it's 39 feet in length. You'll see the right-handers trying to play the track area. That'll be anywhere between the eighth board and the third arrow. Mike Scroggins is going to have the left side of the lane to himself. He's going to be playing in between first and second arrow, probably closer to first. The interesting note, though, is Mike Scroggins did have the highest average on the Dick Weber oil pattern, but it wasn't his highest average of the week. He actually averaged higher on Chameleon but he felt there was a bigger dispersion between averages on the Dick Weber. He felt like he had more of an advantage on the Dick Weber. Is there more of an advantage for lefties overall on that oil pattern? You look at the numbers, and I think they speak for themselves. He averaged 244 on the Dick Weber oil pattern. The next closest average of our top five players was 231 by Pete Weber. Again, we're talking about Mike Scroggins, your top seed today. Should he win in the title match, he will be your player of the year. If not, the honor will go to 50-year-old Walter Ray Williams, Jr. Here is Wes Mallott, who for at least the next 86 minutes is still your player of the year. Mm. Ten pin shy of an opening three bagger. Boy, and what a season he had last season. But it's been a struggle as well for Wes Malott in terms of timing. He's been in and out of timing all season long and has not yet won, although it's been a steady campaign for 09 and 2010, West Malott still looking for that first title. And he whiffs on the 10. Come on, Wesley. And, and this is just getting back to that timing and, and some swing issues that we that I just got done talking about. Wes has been missing a lot of spares like this. He's been having trouble making good shots. And right now, an early open frame for West Malott in the third. So Angelo will step up in the bottom of the third, seeking his first strike of 
Match number one. Nice shot there for Brad Angel, his best finish, Rob, this season, ninth. But you know what, he's got a great attitude. He, can't, he says, I'm coming in with no expectations. And you know, if I win, I win. If I climb the ladder, that'll be great. If not, the consolation prize, I get to go home and see my family. Yeah, it was interesting telling us yesterday that one tournament he didn't bowl this season was the Dick Weber Open on this oil pattern. He was back home for the birth of his daughter, Riley the second girl in the Angelo family. How about that? Back-to-back -back jacks for well, Brad. And I'll tell you what, Brad Angelo could have easily had four in a row to start with tripping a four pin and the second frame solid eight that should have struck. But, you know, Brad has proven out here that he is a versatile player and can bowl on anything. Uh, it was just a few years ago when he was the number one player out here um, by virtue of the PBA point list. So he's got the great experience, even though he only has the one victory, but he has proven to, to be versatile out here on the Lumber Liquidators PBA Tour. West gets back on the strike train in the fourth, and here is the big nasty on his season so far. Somewhat of a, a disappointing season in a way. Um, definitely fought through a lot of issues, timing and, and uh, stuff like that. So considering everything that's been going on to, to make five shows and still have a chance to, to come and defend one of the titles that I had last year, I mean, if this is the worst it's going to get, I mean, I'm plenty good with that. And Wes dedicating this week's tournament to an uh, old friend of his, Lionel Jordan. <laughs> Another strike for the nasty Jordan and Wes bowled together years ago. Wes telling me today he shot a 300 game to get them to the finals and Lionel having some, some issues back in New Mexico and Wes said, you know, I'm dedicating it this week to Lionel. He really helped me kind of stay focused, stay grounded this week, get my timing going and keep my focus sharp. So best wishes going out to you, Lionel. Angelo, bottom of the fifth, looking for a three bagger, the lead at two in match number one. Tough leaves so far for Angelo. Well, just two four pins on this right lane and the solid eight on the left lane, but every ball in the pocket, he's making good shots. He's just not a whole lot of breaks after five frames. Stays clean with the spare. Brad, you're making some great shots, but the pins aren't cooperating. What adjustments do you make to try to strike? Well, that last shot over there, um, I think I grabbed that one a little bit. Uh, it checked up early. I thought it might be able to hold, but it left a four pin. I'm gonna have to try to make sure I get it clean off my hand so it doesn't check so early uh, when it hits the lane. I think those last few minutes of practice burned out that spot there in the front, so I gotta make sure I get it through that spot. Thanks, Brett. And interesting that he told us yesterday the reason why he bowled so well this week is he felt like it was much easier for him to get his ball through the front part of the lane than it, than it has been the rest of the season. So he felt like there was more oil up front. Well, he got that one to push, and then it tripped the four because it snapped pretty hard in the back part of the lane. That four has been a bit of a thorn in his side so far, but gets it to drop here in the sixth frame for his third strike. And when we return, the conclusion of match number one. But first, also long, we're going to show you in no particular order the top moments of the season. Here's the first edition. Think of it as our Easter basket gift to you, our viewer. This former unemployed auto worker was this season's Cinderella story on the tour. Tom Smallwood would defeat last season's player of the year, Wes Malott. And not just in any tournament, mind you, but in the first major of the season, the PBA World Championship.
The Lumber Liquidators Marathon Open is brought to you by Lumber Liquidators. Hardwood flooring for less. By GEICO, 15 minutes could save you 15% on car insurance. By Bear Aspirin, expect wonders. And by GoRV. Visit GoRVing.com for a free video. Go affordably. Go RV. And we welcome you back to AMF Country Club Lanes here in Baltimore, Maryland. The fourth consecutive season at the PBA has been at this venue. The 27th PBA stop here in the great bowling city of Baltimore. We're about midway through match number one between last year's player of the year, Wes Millat and Brad Angelo. Angelo on top by one. The big nasty set to close out the sixth looking for a three-bagger. Yeah, and the reason why he's trailing is he flagged a 10-pin in the third. Otherwise, he'd be leading by 11. Come on, Wes. Get slow. Watch this. He has trouble right at the foul line. A little timing issue again. We talked about how he's been struggling with this. And watch him fall off of this shot immediately. Quite honestly, it's not a very good break in terms of pin carry, but I think it's a big break just hitting the pocket. West takes care of that single pin spare conversion. Time now for the winning touch brought to you by Touch of Gray. Gets rid of some gray, never all. And this week's winning touch takes us back to last season's Marathon Open, which was won by today's five seed, Wes Malott. Helped. West earned Player of the Year honors. He won three titles last season while making a tour best nine TV finals. So Wes, your reigning champion here at the Marathon Open. Here he is to open up the seventh off of a spare in the sixth. You like that one and for good reason. It is isn't amazing. You're talking about a feel sport where he can feel it right off his hand immediately. As soon as it leaves those fingertips, he knows it's perfect. Angelo steps up now, the lead at two. Wes, five strikes, just three for Brad. I swear that's the only reason why you re-rack. I know, I like the song. Just so you can get the music. I like the song. The re-rack and the... Gotta pat your foot, it makes me think of like Pink Panther or... House turns into a jazz okay. club. All right, ready? I started feeling a little melancholy Did you? When, yeah. when that music came on. Maybe some beat poetry will go down yeah, here in a moment. I like it. Right through the nose there. Yeah, and, and you heard him talk about how he has to get it through that spot, and you can see that time his bowling ball checked way too early and never pushed down the lane. The good news is he's working on a strike so he doesn't lose count. The bad news, he's got to shoot the 3-6-10, not a give me. So he takes care of it. Head on over to uh, PBA.com right now and submit your more of what matters to you fan question of the day. It's brought to you by the good folks over at One A Day, and you can direct your question to either Chris Barnes or the booth, which is always dangerous. You and I getting a question. Yeah. Perhaps. Understatement. All right. Go on over to PBA.com. Click on the One A Day logo to submit your question. We begin the eighth. Angelo. <laughs> Up two and leaves the 10. Now the lead just one if he converts the 10 pin. But, you know, you take a look at the five players that are on today's telecast, and it goes just great with the theme, I believe. You, Brad Angelo and Wes Malott, obviously both players proving that they can play on just about any oil pattern. Chris Barnes, obviously, or arguably one of the best, if not the best player out here. Pete Weber, well, you don't win 34 times without being versatile. The interesting note, Mike Scroggins, not known for versatility, admitted that he didn't play well in the shark oil pattern earlier in the week, but yet somehow found a way dance? to do what he does best and play the outside part dance. of the lane. See it. Big nasty. So Wes asked Big nasty for a re-rack. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a little more club atmosphere than the Jazz. No you guys are loose, man. Got that right. That's what happens last... You can tell it's the end of the season. End of the season, last stop on the tour. 
So Malott down one. Here's his effort in the eighth off of a strike. A little right of target and a tough lead for him. Again, we showed you those averages earlier in the show of the five finalists. West by far the lowest average on this Dick Weber oil pattern, averaging a 198.71. And not only was it the worst of the five finalists, it was the worst of the seven oil patterns that he had to bowl on this week. We asked him, you know, all right, well, what kind of adjustments do you, do you need to make? The word he used, pray. <laughs> Good day for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Uh-oh. His second air ball. Again, it, it, it's the timing thing with Wes Malai. You, you see the first shot, or excuse me, the shot prior when he flushed it. And as soon as he let go of this shot here, he knows it's bad. The same thing with the first shot when he left the 210. He knew it was bad immediately out of his hand. Now the only chance, in my opinion, he has of winning this match is by striking out. That would give him 212. Brad Angelo's still only in the 20s, 207 to be exact. So an open frame for Wes in the third and the eighth. Here he is in the ninth. Really fast and really firm. And Angelo is in great shape to move on to take on the three seed, Chris Barnes. Andy, you'll quit out and yourself. Again, your number one seed, Mike Scroggins, practicing behind this question. set. Should he win the title match, Scroggins will be your PBA Player of the Year for the first time in his career. You know what's scary, though, about Wes Malad is he makes tele telecasts when he's not bowling well. And when he is bowling well, I don't think there's a player on tour that creates as much room and strikes as much as Wes Malad. His carry percentage is amazing, and he creates more area on the lane than I feel any player out on the tour. Well, we were really spoiled watching him last Come season, on. the kind of Get this back. Regroup for next season year. he had. And you're talking, let's regroup for next year. You heard that from a lot of the guys this week. Hey, I need some momentum now to get me going into next year. The Japan Cup is still out there and some other events, but guys are already looking forward to next season. It'll be an interesting season next year for sure. Strike number four in match number one for Angelo. And Lead at 15. Sorry, Rob, and that's the adjustment uh, from the seventh frame where he left the 3-6-10. He moved in, made sure he pushed the ball through the front part of the lane, and it faces up nicely. The other thing about Brad Angelo's game is, you, you, obviously, you see the great balance, but he's got that voodoo kind of roll. You know, he's got that little spin biscuit kind of roll that really makes the ball push down the lane and then finish hard in the back. And I find it interesting whenever I watch him bowl. You almost look when he's approaching, the, the hand is on, on top of the ball. It's like the palm is facing down, and then he makes that adjustment. You made a point earlier this season. Wherever you're comfortable with on your approach, straighten it out at the end. Kidding me? <laughs> Leaves the eight. Yeah, twice on the left lane. Brad Angel needs Mark and six, and he will advance. But I mean, this is daddy lockups right here. If he strikes, he would be in the two teens and it would be over. That's just not a good break. Getting back to his hand on top of the ball primarily uses that for his spare shot. Right. And it's something that he just has found that works for him. and. He didn't really show it there. He well, saw it earlier in the match. He wasn't throwing his straight ball. Okay, he does it for a straight ball. He gets his hand on top of it and weakens his grip. Hey, and it's just something that works for him. I think that's the beauty of this sport. All of these players come in different shapes, sizes, and styles. Something we saw last week as well in Long Island. Needs six for the win. He showed you the hand thing right there. there. Shows the hand, blows up the rack, and moves on to match number two. So Malat will close out in the 10th, his final frame of the season, the final frame as reigning player of the year. And what are your thoughts on the big nasty season? Well, I, I think Wes is going to go home and regroup, and he's going to say, you know what? And he said it in his sound bite. Hey, if I can have this kind of a season with my B game. I'm fighting through this too myself, so let's get strong, let's get together and uh, get back on the right track, both of us. With you, buddy, thinking about you. And that was a shout out again to his friend Lionel Jordan in New Mexico. And in finishing my thought, he's gonna go home and regroup, he's gonna figure out what he needs to change or work on in his physical games. He's had a taste of the good life, Rob. 
He had a taste of it last season, and that was, uh, you know, once once you get to that level, boy, you're not satisfied with anything else. So Wes is done. Up next, another former PBA Player of the Year, Chris Barnes, getting loose. And he said a title today would bail out his season. Can Chris Barnes win for the first time this season? The three seed takes to the wood when we return this with the PBA live on ESPN. Chris Barnes getting set to take on your four seed, Brad Angelo, the winner to take on Pete Weber. Even she didn't think she could do it, but Kelly Kulik proved she more than belonged at the Tournament of Champions in Vegas, rolling over Mika Koivu Niemi, and then Chris Barnes on the way to a historic victory, the first time ever that a woman had triumphed over a man in a major professional sporting event. Rob Stone, Randy Peterson, back here live with you from Baltimore, Maryland. There's a live look at your Three seed, Chris Barnes, player of the year in 07 08. Step ladder has been updated and he will take on Brad Angelo, your four seed here in match number two. Angelo winning over the big nasty West Malat 207 192. Chris adding a late ball to the rack. Angelo will start us off here in match number two. The winner of this one to take on PDW. Pete Weber, your number two seat. So Angelo only had five strikes in match number one. And only one pair gets a strike there. Time now for the introduction of Chris Barnes. He is a 12-time winner on the PBA Tour, including two majors. A member of Team USA, former PBA rookie and player of the year from Double Oak, Texas. Please welcome Chris Barnes. We talked last match about the challenging season that Wes Malott had. Ditto, really, for Chris Barnes. Three times a runner-up this season, zero victories. Mm. A messenger sails in front of the tent. Rob, he's had eight consecutive seasons of winning at least one title, so he still has today and the Japan Cup. He'd like to take care of that today, but I think that you and I both agreed yesterday in watching him on the Dick Weber oil pattern that's probably the best we've seen him physically throw it all year. He told us it's the best he's felt since last year's U.S. Open. And Chris Barnes lost to Mike Scroggins last year in the U.S. Open. Chris Barnes and Norm Duke were in the race for Player of the Year in the final event of the season at the U.S. Open. Mike Scroggins ended up being the spoiler, winning it all, giving the title to Wes Malott. Now one of these guys may step up and be the spoiler to Mike Scroggins' quest for Player of the Year later today. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> Barnes goes, spare, strike. Hey, yeah, he looks good. He looks comfortable. He, I think he really likes his ball reaction. That's all about just staying in the moment and relying on what his feel was like yesterday and just trying to continue that same theme. Brad Angelo up, making his first TV appearance since November 30th of last season, where he finished third. Strike for Angelo. Hey, Brad, it's Randy. Hey, how much has the oil pattern changed from game one to now? Uh, I don't know that it changed from the end of game one until now, but it certainly has changed from when we took the lanes um, before we came on the air. Um, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, I'm probably two left of where I started, but my hand position has changed uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I, I can't roll it to get it off my hand. I got to make sure I get it, get it through that spot. So hopefully we'll do what I can here. Thanks, Brad. And Rob, he's going, 
with a little bit more of a spin release to get it to push through the front part of the lane. Remember that the more you roll the bowling ball end over end, the more it's going to read the lane surface. The more you spin it, the more it's going to scoot through that front part of the lane. Three in a row for Angelo in this tournament. Essentially concludes the PBA season. Yes, there's still the Japan Cup, but player of the year honors will be wrapped up. So we conclude one. We kick off another one tonight. Major League Baseball firing it up tonight. Yankees, Red Sox live on ESPN2, 8 Eastern. Tonight coverage begins at baseball tonight at 7 in the New York and Boston markets. ESPN News will be on. Both those teams trying to take care of the Tampa Bay Rays in the AL East, the team to beat, if you ask this guy. You say that with <laughs> such conviction and this huge smile. America's team, the Tampa Bay Rays, baby. As Barnes steps up, bottom of the screen, you can see other finishers. Walter Ray Williams Jr. finishing sixth yesterday. Right through the nose was Barnes. And how about Joe Ciccone? He needs a big week this week to secure an exempt spot. He was outside the number, and Joe steps up and finishes 10th. So congratulations to Joe Ciccone. Terrible. And, and this is real interesting to me, Rob. You, you, you hear Brad say that he has to kind of spin it a little bit more, change his release to get the ball to push through the front part of the lane. Chris Barnes, a notorious heavy hand, heavy rolling, end over end guy. And so there's the mistake that you're going to see from Barnes when his ball reads too early. It's going through the nose. That was a great spare on the 3 6 9 10. Chris, what are you seeing so far through three frames? Well, uh, compared to yesterday, they're a lot tighter down lane for me. Um, so I'm struggling a little bit more to, to get the ball to face up. I've had to make some ball changes. Uh, you know, I got, uh, I got four shots and I'm uh, trying to get them lined up here. But uh, the right lane's a little bit tricky for me. Barnes on the left lane right now where he struck in the second. And Rob, you heard him say that the right lane is tricky. Well, Barnes was a higher seed, so he gets choice of starting lane and position. He chooses to finish on the left lane for good reason. Nice shot there, light mixer. Right now, Chris Barnes, to have a chance in this match, he needs to figure out the right lane. Brad Angelo is locked and loaded on both lanes. <laughs> Angelo looking to open up match number two with a hand bone. You didn't. Sure did. Please tell me you didn't. Well, I'll tell you what, for the right-handers, and I know how disappointed you are that he didn't get this fourth strike, but for the righties, it's going to be an issue with that right lane. And I think it's a huge advantage for Chris, Chris Barnes if he can stay close enough because he is finishing on the left lane. Angelo up 18, trying to take care of the 6-10. And misses the 10. Well, every shot in bowling makes somebody happy. Right now, Chris Barnes feeling pretty good about getting right back into this match as Brad Angelo chops the six right off the ten. Let's see how Angelo responds to that open frame as we begin the fifth of match number two. The winner to take on two seed Pete Weber. You know, I think Brad has a really good blueprint of what the lanes are doing. He, he has a game under his belt. He's a lot more relaxed because of that. And I think that he has a really good idea of what he needs to do. Now it's just a matter of execution. Third time today, he's left that four pin. Part of being a versatile player is being a good spare shooter. 
even though he chopped the six off the 10, you won't see Brad Angelo do that very often, but very steady with the spares. Same for Chris Barnes and converting the three, six, nine, ten 10 in the third frame. Hey, we all know that they can throw a lot of strikes, but when you don't throw strikes out here, you better cover spares. And here's Barnes on that right lane, which has been problematic for him so far. Nine spare, six spare. And gets a strike there in the fifth. Our thanks to Mark Dornberger, the general manager here at AMF. Country Club Lanes, again, the fourth consecutive season the PBA's right been at this wonderful facility here in Baltimore. Great bowling community here in Maryland. Remember when Chris said that they're a little tighter down the lane for him? Watch how subtle this back end reaction is for him on this shot. Man, what a nice shot there, only to leave a ring in 10. But do you see how smooth that transitional move is down the lane for him? So it's one thing just to get it to the break point. It's another to get, to get the ball to behave properly. Just a little bit of a balance issue there, but still, this is a pretty good shot. I'd take 10 of those anytime and take my chances. So Barnes remains clean through five and a half. The lead for your three seed is three pins. The winner to take on Pete Weber. When we return, a flashback to last week's memorable title match, plus the conclusion of Barnes versus Angelo. Although he's an amateur, Brian Zysik played like a seasoned pro in the last weekend's Mark Roth Plastic Ball Championship. Both he and Jason Belmonte, huge in the tenth, forced a one ball roll off. Belmo could only drop nine. Zysik got all ten to drop. The first time an amateur had won on the tour since 2002. And that one dubbed an instant classic by ESPN. was shown again Monday evening on ESPN Classic. You know, Zysik and company were there watching it. And he and I were exchanging texts in the middle of the rebroadcast as well. What a great match that was. I, I just, I'm not sure I've had as much fun on the PBA circuit as I did watching that match. Yeah, I, I, can't, I, I, I think it's one of the greatest moments that I've ever been a part of and, and you know to happen to a guy like Brian Zizek it's just a, such a nice guy it was tremendous and another point and you and I were talking about yesterday what a great show of class by Jason Belmonte a, a wonderful performer a, an anguishing defeat yet he comes back talks live on air to you handled it so well with Zizek's family as well just a, a good showing by both men here's yes, Angelo sir. bottom of the sixth no chance mm -hmm. no chance what well, no chance to hit the right side of the head pin, but... A strike's a strike, baby! Yeah, and you know what? You're bowling a guy like Chris Barnes, man. You, you, you throw a Brooklyn at him, and then you the raise your arms. You know, that, all that all that does is, like, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. All you're going to do is really irritate Chris Barnes. Come on, you really think that irritates Barnes? Oh, trust me. All right. I think he's got other issues on his mind right now, to be honest with you. And we'll talk about that in a second, what he was doing during the commercial break. Angelo looking for strike number five. And gets it. And Parlay's a nice break right there, but, you know, Rob, you talked about it. Chris Barnes on his last shot on the left lane came very close to fouling. Watch this. Boy, and that, that's about as close as you can get without having the red light go on. So what does he do? He changes soul and heel. This is the first shot that he's going to throw with a brand new combination. Remember, he got no practice shots when we were at break. When's the last time you saw somebody do that? I can't remember. I've seen, obviously, the players take the shoe brush there and, and kind of rough up the nap of the soul, but I've never seen them change soul and heel in the middle of the game. Obviously, this Barnes guy knows what he's doing. Well, Chris, we just Real showed strike. video of you making the shoe adjustment. What was the problem, and uh, what did you solve? What's that? We just showed video of you making the shoe adjustment. What was the problem? Uh, the approaches are just slicker today. It's about 15 degrees hotter, maybe 20 degrees hotter on the set, and the approaches have a little bit of humidity in the air. It's not there now, and 
and so uh, I just needed a heel that stopped a little quicker. And how did it work out for you? I know you got a strike, but I mean, did it feel good for you? Yeah, so far so good. I didn't go Brooklyn. I guess it was all right. <laughs> got to bring up the Brooklyn. Thanks, bud. You're you right. Quest, you I know, Randy. Me. I know. I can't believe you would question me. I'm smarter than that. You're right. Told you. Here's Barnes in the eighth, looking for a pair. Let me just say this, you know, Grant Angelo's not afraid to get in there and mix it up with you. He'll do it. But yeah, I, I told you, Chris Barnes, don't throw Brooklyn. Listen, you throw Brooklyn at Chris Barnes, you put your head down, you act like you're disgusted and embarrassed, and you move on. You sh certainly don't showboat and get in his grill. He wasn't showboating and getting but up in his grill. He put up his arms. He was excited. He got a big break. You're not allowed to do that? Not when you throw a Brooklyn against your opponent. No. All right. All right, that's the protocol according to you. That's the protocol. That's the PBA protocol, my all friend. All right, you know me, I'm all about taunting. Now, it. just so you know, Brad didn't mean anything by it. He wasn't trying to rub exactly. it in his face. It was none of that. Three strikes in a row Brooklyn. for Angelo. That wasn't a Brooklyn shot there. Ooh. Now. Now, now, now. Boys, did, did I not just say that Brad's not afraid to mix it up? The Italian coming out, Nangelo. I like it. A little Italian stallion. We got us a little game now. Yeah. And, and it's not just a game on the lanes. It's a game between the ears as well. I think the words were, that one ain't Brooklyn. And he is talking smack to Barnes. Takes a seat, does Angelo. And what does Chris have in store for him in the ninth? Barnes working on a pair as well. Hey, can you blame him? Guy just got called out for his Brooklyn, and now he's giving it right back. You know, good for him. Now, Brad Angelo can strike out and shoot 256. The best Chris Barnes can do if he strikes out 249. Let's see what Barnes has in store here, bottom of the ninth. No words exchanged. Uh, you know something's brewing inside of Barnes. Oh, yeah. Well, he's just going to get up now and try to stuff three in the 10th and go, hey, try to match that. No Brooklyn's. That doesn't count. He'll say something to try to get in the Brad's dome. Also, he needs to keep the pressure on. Ball never tighter and tighter. recovered down the lane. You heard him say tighter and tighter, and it just never recovered down the lane. Leaves the two pin, and now he is in big trouble. He's only going to be in the 220s. Brad Angelo is already in the 230s. A mark here. Brad Angelo will just need a mark in the 10th frame. And Brad will move on to take on PDW, Pete Weber. It's not often you see some verbal warfare here on television in the PBA. It, it happens maybe a little bit more muted. This one was pretty well out and in the open. And you know Pete Weber, who's coming up next, can play that game as well. Without question. Tighter and tighter and tighter down the lane for Chris wow. Barnes. And nine is good because that forces Brad Angelo to mark. So any kind of mark and good count, Brad will move on. But I'll tell you what, I love the stuff back and forth between Brad and, and Chris. You know, these guys have a long history. They're friends, but you know what? 
in this environment, there is no friendship. Do what you got to do to win within reason. And then when it's all said and done, we can go back to being friends again. Seven strikes in match number two for Angelo, including four in the last four frames. Trying to drop a nickel here in the 10th. Big Yahtzee drop by Angelo. Yeah, you got Brad kind of ticked off now. And Everybody's angry. Yeah, he's it's Easter Sunday. Come on, people, let's get along. Look at the demeanors change. The eyebrows are mm -hmm. going down. Brad's going over for, I don't know, another bowling ball. Yep, grabbing another bowling ball because this match is over. But here's the difference in bar reactions. Brad Angelo's speed's a little slower. He's got that, that tilt, more side roll, so he can get his ball to scoot the front and still finish really hard in the back part of the lane. Chris Barnes never had that luxury in this match. The frustrations continue this season for Barnes. Angelo will move on with another strike. Angelo, your four seed up next, though. A guy who's really on a roll, Pete last Weber. Show, huh? <laughs> never before. Last show, usually, never the first. By the way, hi, Leslie. That was a live shot of Pete Weber, who's just about 10 feet away from Angelo right now, as Angelo throws his last one here in match number two. Concludes with seven strikes to close out this match. A feisty one, eventually won by Angelo, 256, 227. The last time we saw PDW on TV, he was busy giving an eager phone talk to business. What does Weber have in store for us today and what has already been a little testy Sunday afternoon of bowling? The Lumber Liquidators Marathon Open is brought to you by Roto Grip, the fastest growing bowling ball brand in the world. Roto Grip is king of them all. By Brunswick, the Deadly Siege, a high performance bowling ball from Brunswick. Choose the siege and let the mayhem begin. By Atonic. Visit atonic.com slash bowl. And by the United States Bowling Congress, the all new bowl.com, your online source for all things bowling. Log on to bowl.com today. Rob Stone, Randy Peterson, back here with you as we get set for match number three where your two seed, PDW, Pete Weber, set to take on Brad Angelo. But first, we flash back to earlier in the season in a great tournament in New Orleans. The Chris Paul Celebrity Invitational featured the NBA star versus the likes of Ludacris, Lamar Woodley, Heinz Ward, and some of the PBA's best, including Jason Belmonte, who threw the winning strike which allowed a jubilant Chris Paul to finally take home the trophy from his own event. So Weber was part of that tournament as well in New Orleans, partnered with Ludacris, what a great team they made. All the sunglasses, perfect. We update the stepladder. Brad Angelo set to take on Pete Weber here in our semifinal. The winner to take on number one seed Mike Scroggins. Again, Mike Scroggins with the win today will earn Player of the Year honors for the first time in his career. And, and if Brad wants, wants to continue the theme of the, the trash talking, he's, he's got the right opponent. Angelo will start this one off as the lower seed. He'll be on the left lane. Another opening strike for Angelo. That's eight in a row going back to last game. Time now for the intros for your number two seed, Pete Weber. His 34 PBA Tour victories ties him for third on the all-time list. His eight major wins include four U.S. Open victories. From St. Louis, Missouri, please welcome Pete Weber. And Robin, in, in terms of ball reaction, Pete Weber can get really, really close to what Brad Angelo is doing because Pete can throw it slow and he can really create a lot of axis rotation. 
Look for Pete Weber's ball reaction to be very similar to what Brad Angelo is doing. See, I told you. You've been nothing but right all day, Randy. Am I ever wrong? No, sir. Nice shot there. Talking about the player of the year implications today for Mike Scroggins, Pete Weber, and Brad Angelo with a chance to be spoiler. Pete Weber has never won player of the year honors. Eight majors he's won. The last one coming in 07 when he won the U.S. Open. His 34 tour titles tied for third most with Mark Roth. Back-to-back -back opening jacks for PDW. Well, Pete Weber just needs to get his legs underneath him and somehow shake the nerves and the cobwebs, and I'll tell you, this is a good way to do it. Have your ball come in just a little bit high when you're working on a strike and trip the four out, and you can see just by that reaction how pleased he was. Oh, my. Angelo improving as this oil pattern goes through some slight adjustments. He had a 207 versus Malott, only five strikes there. Had 10 strikes in the last game en route to a 256. And he opens up with a pair of strikes here in our semi. Brad's real comfortable. He's watching the oil pattern change in front of him, and he knows exactly what moves to make. See what he did in match number one, only throwing five of 11 strikes in match in that first match, but my, oh my, came back strong in the second match. Big 256 game in 10 of 12. Last match, some verbal shots between Angelo and Barnes. Seemed to really focus Angelo. Mm. This is the seven. Well, it was like somebody turned on the light switch, though. I mean, completely changed his demeanor, and it went from, okay, you know, this is going to be a great day of Sunday bowling, to all of a sudden, that's it. It's game on now. You can see there, Brad leaving the blower seven, and he's not liking that a whole lot. Hey, Brad, what did the verbal conversation you had with Chris Barnes last game do for your game? Uh, well, I think anytime somebody tries to play any mental games with me, it definitely is motivating because you know, that O in the last letter of my name doesn't allow me to take anything, <laughs> being Italian. He said it, not me. Here's Pete Weber, perfect through two, bottom of the third effort. Get up. It was a different PDW we saw yesterday than we've seen the past couple months. He had that confidence, he had that aura about him where he was saying, look, every ball change I made this week, I had confidence in, I knew it was gonna work. And, he had that attitude of, of, I think, what people are used to seeing from him. Well, he, he had some time off, so mentally he was he was fresh coming into this event. And, you know, I think it was great in some of the things he was saying it, it, that, you know, it feels like it's the first time if I were to win again. And, you know what, all of that stuff I'm putting behind me, and I'm just going to go out there and bowl. And interestingly enough, on the Stick Weber Oil pattern, the last game, he shot 300. <laughs> This one just pushes just a little bit past the head pin, leaving that week 10. But Rob, you're right. He says, you know what? I feel good. I'm bowling well. My mental game is sharp. And this game does look really good right now. Ah. And he misses the 10 pin. Wonderful jinx. That's unusual. <sighs> oh, and this is the the mental laps that you just can't have in, in some of the struggles that he's had on TV in the last three years. Just a whiff 10 pin and you know where Brad Angelo is right now, you can't give him any openings. We'll see what that 
does mentally for Pete's game. He can use motivation in a lot of different ways. Not all of them positive. Angelo in the fourth. A little heavy there. Well, that ball looked like it made two moves going down the lane because as soon as it saw friction, man, it checked early and then checked again once it got to the back part of the lane. Went through the nose, only leaving the 3-6. The spare here will be tied up through four. And we are tied, but again, Weber coming off that open frame in the fourth as he continues to sit. What you see now, Rob, is a little bit of carry issue because of the angle that Brad has to play. The old pattern is broken down. The front Take part of the lane is starting to go, which forces him to the center part of the lane, and now he must create angle. Well, when you create angle, you still got to get the ball to flip up at the right time to get into the 1-3 solidly. That went late, leaving the week 10. Angelo had a 300 game this week on the Cheetah oil pattern, also a 299 on the Cheetah. Takes care of the 10, which Pete Weber could not do in the fourth. So Pete started off strike, 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 and then whiffed the 10 pin, dropping the ball in the gutter in the fourth. He's had some time to think about it, as you see what he did in qualification this week, having two 300 games, including the last game yesterday of qualifying, which jumped him up to the two seed spot. And I thought it was interesting when, when right. speaking with Pete at age 47, I asked him, you know, how do you like the tournament? He says, the more games, the better. He's always felt that way. In fact, the more games Pete Weber can bowl, he always feels like the cream's going to rise to the top, and, and I agree with him. Takes care of the 10 there as he goes to the I left I of it. Make it. And I here is going so long, I knew eventually I was going to. Here is Pete on what a win today would mean to him. This win would it, it would, it would probably feel like my first win again. I mean, it's been so long since I won. Uh, I've had a little problems on TV, but right now I, I just don't feel that. I'm fed up with it. I really don't care about the past anymore. I'm going to be there. His last title, March 4th, 2007 at the U.S. Open. Back on the strike train is PDW. Well, there's Mr. Versatility, boy. He's been that way throughout his entire career. And just beautiful form and technique by one of the greatest ever. And the lead at one for PDW. When we return, we'll tell you what Pete Weber thinks about this year's Player of the Year race. And let's just say he doesn't fully agree with the system. We'll leave it at that. All right. Can't wait. Norm Duke started off slowly in the Cheetah Championship against newcomer Ryan Simonelli. He lost the first game of their match and trailed in game two by 42 pins. How many? I said 42, Norm. But a little comic relief helped get his mojo going, got the crowd back on his side. He ended up winning the best of seven match, four to one, and ended up being tour title at number 33, one of the PBA's most accomplished and charismatic players. Thank you. And you can see Norm Duke next as he takes part of the PBA Experience Showdown presented by Bowl.com. You can see that one next Sunday. Coverage begins 1 Eastern on ESPN. We talked about how demanding this Lumber Liquidators Marathon Open has been. 13 players withdrew, including 11 in the first two rounds alone. One of them who withdrew, Norm Duke. Ready? Okay. Angelo and Pete Weber. 
halfway through our semifinal. The winner to take on Mike Scroggins. Scroggins, your top seed with a win today, would be your PBA Player of the Year. If he does not win, the honor goes to 50-year-old Walter Ray Williams Jr., who just missed the telecast, finishing sixth. In any event, did you mention that it would be the oldest player ever to win the PV? Regardless. Or P uh, Player of the Year? Yep, regardless if it's Scroggins or Walter Ray, Earl Anthony, at the age of 45, won it in 1983. Scroggins is 46 as of March 12th. And Walter Ray at the age of 50. But here is Angelo and Weber in the sixth, in the semis. Big pickup for Angelo. Great look at that one coming into the living room. Well, nicely done there to stay clean. He's still only shooting 2-0 and right now trailing by three. But the right lane is the issue again, as it has been all day. And unfortunately for Brad Angelo, he has to finish on the right lane. Just one strike in three frames on that right lane. Here he is on the left. And that's just his third strike here in match number three. And he had 10 in match number two versus Chris Barnes, including the final seven. Pete Weber wanted to give a shout out to his good friend Leslie Fedoni in California, who is recovering from major back surgery. Leslie Fedoni, really good friends with Tracy and Pete. Right now, Tracy trying to will pins down for her husband, Pete Weber. Pete was talking about Tracy to us yesterday, saying, you know, Tracy was saying, hey, man, your form looks good. You're really solid at the line. And Pete's saying, she hasn't said that to me in a long time. And I think one of the biggest assets for Pete Weber, you know, we all talk about his big arms. When you see the, the hand of the inside part of the ball, but look at the hand open at release. That's no grab, my friend. I think that's the Pete Weber trademark that I always look for is at release, at follow through. If I can see those fingers pointing straight down towards the pins, it always tells me that Pete Weber did not grab it at all at the bottom of the swing. Looking for a three bagger here in the eighth. Come on, block! Yeah. Gets it! Right, come on! Hey, look who just showed up to the party! Come on. The attitude of PDW is back. Come on, Paul. Yeah, that's right. Come on. So Weber started with an opening three bagger and has another one here. Frame six, seven, and eight. Angelo just three strikes total, but one in the seventh. He's down 23. And on the right lane, which has been tough for him. Gets the late kick. Huge late kick, Rob. Huge. Just cut the lead to 13, but more importantly, he can cut it to three with a strike here in the ninth frame. If he doesn't catch that hit in the eighth, he's got little or no chance of winning the match. Big time trip for pin right here. Brad Angelo can strike out for 244. Bad news for Brad, Pete Weber can strike out for 257. It's all about keeping pressure on your opponent when you get down to the ninth and 10th frame and Brad Angelo needs to strike here to keep the pressure on PDW. The 10 was wobbling and a messenger just rolled by it. That was nine and a half, and Brad really needed that hit. Check this out. Ball finishes real late. Five goes to the to the into the seven. Mm. Six kind of nudges the ten, but doesn't go. Now you're, you're talking millimeters there. Well, he, he can really. Uh, do some damage here, step up here in the 10th frame. He's already in the 220s. Brad Angelo, the best he can shoot is 223. A strike here. This match is 
all but over. And I know that he's working on a three-bagger, Rob, so take it away. Love an Easter ham bone right now. Just gave you one. That's awesome. Awesome, baby. Hellbone. Oh, God. I was thinking that, you know what? If he struck here, he was going to give Rob that Easter ham bone. And sure enough. Yes, that's right. There you go, Rob. <laughs> I love it. And Brad Angelo lost it, too. He was sitting in his chair cracking up. Is there anybody better than PDW? Got to look long and hard. We begin the 10th. Yeah. That's enough. That's enough. That's a winner. That's enough. Pete Weber's going to bowl Mike Scroggins for the title. And Pete talking to us yesterday about that, says, look, if I get to Scroggy, he's going to have to earn his Player of the Year title. Boy, and he's going to put it on him, too. Yeah. Right I now, Pete Weber, year. if he misses this, he's going to shoot 224. The best Brad Angelo can shoot is 223. PDW is back. He finally wins a, a game on television. In, right? huh? I should get a couple extra in then, right? You well, might. You never know. <laughs> In an effort to speed things up, Angelo throws there in the 10th. Here's Pete Weber to close out his match. Takes care of seven pins and walks away with the win. His next step goes to the title match. Weber to take on Mike Scroggins in the final event of this PBA season. Mike Scroggins with the win will be your PBA Player of the Year. Time now for another top moment. We go back to the World Series of Bowling and the Shark Championship. It had been more than 14 years since Jack Jerk last won a PBA Tour title. It was the longest stretch ever. But when Michael Fagan left the 10 in the 10th, the Shark Championship title match went to a roll-off. Jerk would strike. Fagan would flag the head pin, giving Jurek the win and ending his unenviable title drought. Bill O'Neill's prayers were answered this season as he finally scored the first win of his career, taking the Chameleon Championship. And with that monkey off his back, O'Neill went on to have a dream season that included a victory at the Lumber Liquidators U.S. Open. Hammer balling right here. Live look at Mike Scroggins as he goes through his final preps. As he is one win away from earning Player of the Year honors, he'll have to get by Pete Weber, who just advanced taking care of Brad Angelo, 233-212. Time now for our GEICO Championship recap. Randall, the honors, please. You've got it, Rob. Match number one was a very friendly match. Wes <laughs> Malott steps up, and unfortunately for Wes, leaves a 210 split in the eighth frame. Brad Angelo, a pretty benign 207 game, and he would take down the big nasty. But in match number two, not so friendly. Real strike. Yeah, that wasn't a Brooklyn shot, and he gave him a real good shot to the chops with a 256 game. Then in match number three, guess who's back? It's PDW. That's right. He gives a little love to not only Brad Angelo, but he gave some to you, my friend. My, my Easter is now complete. I got a ham bone <laughs> chop from PDW. Rob Stone, Randy Peterson back here with you in Baltimore. So we're set now for our title match. Last year, Mike Scroggins finished fourth in the Player of the Year points race. Now he is one win away in the final match of the season. 
He gets it. He is your player of the year. He is the only lefty on today's show. We've seen nothing but righties work the lane so far. How do you see this one shaping up right now between PDW and Mike Scroggins? Well, it, PDW is locked and loaded. He, he's zeroed in, he's focused, and he's throwing it great. And it's all going to come down to whether or not Mike Scroggins can manage the nerves. We all know that he's got the physical talents, but there's so much pressure on him today. The Player of the Year honors are on the line, not just the title. It's something that he's really never even thought about. It's all going to boil down to how well he manages that thing sitting on top of his shoulders. That little thing called Player of the Year. We asked him about it yesterday. He said, look, I don't know how I'm going to handle it. I haven't really been in this position before. Player of the Year is something I always dreamed of. I never really thought I could be in contention. And bam, here I am. When we return, the title match uninterrupted. They're bowling on an oil pattern named after Pete Weber's late father, Dick Weber. Can Pete play spoiler or will Scroggins be your Player of the Year? Fifty-year-old Walter Ray Williams Jr. won the very first event of the season, the Motor City Open, and never looked back. Come to yeah! He would make five appearances on television this season and would also capture the eighth major of his Hall of Fame career, taking down Chris Barnes at the USBC Masters. And Walter Ray tied with Bill O'Neill and Mike Scroggins right now top the player of the year points race. Mike Scroggins must win this match to earn the honor. If not, <clears throat> the first tiebreaker. The PBA points list is heavily in favor of Walter Ray Williams Jr. and it'll be the 50-year-old winning player of the year honors. We begin our title match. Pete Weber seeking tour title number 35 versus Mike Scroggins. Weber opens up with the strike. Time now for the intro of your number one seed. He is an eight-time winner on the PBA Tour, including major wins at the 2005 USBC Masters and the 09 US Open from Amarillo, Texas. Please welcome Mike Scroggins. And Rob, I spoke with Mike about an hour and a half, well, about two hours ago. I said, how did you sleep last night? He said, honestly, he said, I got about two hours of sleep. I couldn't sleep at all. I tossed and turned. I thought about every different scenario. He goes, can't you tell by the bags under my eyes, Randy? Scroggy leaves the seven pin on his first effort. Boy, it was a nice shot, too. You know, typically for Mike Scroggins, he gets off to a nice start. First two or three shots are usually all in the pocket, and then he starts to get a little loose. He averaged a 244 yesterday on this Dick Weber oil pattern, easily the best of today's five finalists. That's why he picked it as the number one seed. He gets to pick what oil pattern he wants to bowl on. Hey, spare. Takes care of the spare. He won the 2008 Dick Weber Open on this oil pattern. And Weber with the strike, Scroggins with the spare, through one. Time now to look at our bear breakdown. Weber, 34 tour titles, Scroggins with eight. Pete Weber, only Walter Ray Williams Jr. has more career earnings than PDW. That's a lot of cash. I'm gonna try to hit, hit up one of these guys for a loan after the show. First strike of the title match for Scroggins and Randy. All week coming in, the conversation was about player of the year, and it was more Walter Ray Williams Jr. and Bill O'Neill because they were tied atop, and it was an, oh, by the way, Mike Scroggins, if he wins and nobody else gets higher than second, you know, he might get a chance. Scroggins just kind of kept working his way up the ladder through the week, and suddenly he became the storyline. Walter Ray Williams Jr. finishing sixth, just missing the TV show. Scroggins now one win away from the title but he has to get through PDW first. He Weber made a ball change to start this championship match. So far, so good. Head on over to PBA.com. Check out Extra Frame and PBA's online video subscription service. 
It features hours of live competition that you can't see anywhere else. Other features include interviews, archived ESPN telecasts, and the new 39 by 60 highlight show. All that for just $7.99 a month. Sign up today over at PBA.com. Weber, perfect through two in our title match. I told you he was going to be tough and he was going to bring in this title match. Mike Scroggins is going to have to bowl his A game to have any shot at taking down Pete Weber. This one will not be gifted to Scroggins. Weber, a 233 in the last match. Seven strikes in that one, including four in a row, six through nine. Scroggins, bottom of the third. Off a strike. Mm. Well, this ball never gets all the way up to the one two pocket. Mike Scroggins now has to fight his way through not only the nerves, but the pressure that Pete Weber has applied early. The three, five, six. Well played by Scroggy. Time now for our One A Day fan question of the day brought to you by One A Day. More of what matters to you question goes to us. Could you tell us your surprises, disappointments, and feel-good stories for the season? I'd like to thank A.J. Collins from Oakley, California for that one. And Boy, I mean, this tour was just loaded with great stories this season. There was a lot of really feel-good stories. I think my, my best feel-good story would have to be Kelly Kulik and Brian Zizek. And don't forget what Tom Smallwood did. Yeah, wish I, I mean, all three of those. I, I know, I know. The Kelly, Kelly's was really special. I, I'm, I agree with you. <laughs> Roggins can't get the drop. Any disappointments for you? Yeah, I, th I think it's a bit of a letdown for Wes Malott uh, not winning this season and also for Chris Barnes not winning this season. Uh, biggest surprises, I think, is probably how, how many one-time winners we had. Yeah. Michael Fagan, Bill O'Neill, it, and it, it's not surprising Anthony that. Anthony McCause, all those guys. Not surprising that they won. It's just the, the number of first-time winners. And you touched on one guy, Bill O'Neill, had a wonderful yeah. season. Again, he will conclude the season tied for points on the player of the year point list, but again, the tiebreaker will go to Walter A. Williams, Jr. if Mike Scroggins can't win here, and he is in the early 21 pin hole and Weber hasn't even bowled yet in the fourth PDW looking for an opening hand bone in the title match what about Rob where's Rob's Pete there it is God love you. He doesn't even have to talk to me. We just, no, no. We just communicate through hand gestures. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's right, baby. I'm on it now. <laughs> Did he pull a Babe Ruth? <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing, man. Unreal. This is good stuff. PDW. At his finest. One. Yahtzee! Take that. Take that one. A double chop from PDW and his wife Tracy. Really enjoying this one. Boy, and if you're Mike Scroggs, you got to be asking yourself, what have I gotten myself into? Where has this guy been for the last three years? Well, halfway through, Pete Weber looks like he's back. I mean, Scroggins is in a bar fight, and he's got no backup. Cameraman's. And Weber has got all his buddies just jumping on Scroggy right now. I mean, there could not be more momentum right now for Pete Weber. Up 41. Mike Scroggins, just one strike through four. Here's his effort in the fifth. Needs to get something going. Oh. Gets the late 10 to drop. 
And the smile is back and a little confidence there for Scroggins. Poor Mike Scroggins, man. He came in, you know, he had so much going for him. Go ahead, Rob. You ready for the RV? I want to hear it. <laughs> we go to the we go to Arlington, Texas for the PBA Experience Showdown presented by Bowl.com. You can see it next Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. Coming away from the USBC International Training and Research Center. And then the following Sunday, the PBA Women's Series Showdown from 1 to 3 Eastern. We go back to live coverage. Scroggins working off a strike. Begin the sixth. Back to back jacks for Scroggins. And I'm sorry, I got so I, I got so off track because I got so fired up that we were firing up the RV. What I wanted to say was poor Mike Scroggins, man. He had so much going for him today and, and so much on the line. And he just wanted to come in and you know take care of business and win player of the year. And then he just gets mugged. He, he's been jumped so far by Weber, who's been perfect through five. Pin shy of an opening six pack. Mm. Hey, now before we start handing the check and trophy over to Pete Weber, keep in mind that even though Mike Scroggins is trailing by 30, he can still strike out and shoot 259. Ah. I don't think Weber was thrilled by that, but he gets the result he needed, Probably taking care of the spare. Mr. To remain exciting clean. on the spares today. Pete, Try not to do that anymore. Very talking to face. Today. He's got to be feeling really good right now, man. He's throwing it really good. He's got a great look, great ball reaction. He had two 300 games this week. There were 12 total perfect games today. A really high number when you consider the season average. Just over four and a half per tournament. Yet 12 were dropped this week in Baltimore. Two on this Dick Weber oil pattern. One by Pete Weber, one by Jeff Carter. Back on the strike train is PDW. Uh. Well, if you're Mike Scroggins, you just got to tell yourself, okay, in order to have a chance, I got to strike out because Pete Weber is going to continue to throw shots like this throughout the rest of the match. For Scroggins, as he gets ready for his effort in the seventh, this will be his seventh top ten finish of the season, his fifth top five. We asked Pete Weber yesterday about the player of the year race, and, you know, he essentially said no disrespect to Mike Scroggins, but he feels that the player of the year points race should really be a vote by exempt players only. And if there was a vote, I don't think there's any question, it would be Walter A. Williams Jr. as your player of the year. And that's coming from Pete Weber. Scroggins yeah. gets the strike in the seventh. Come on. And about three in a row for Scroggy now. Yeah, but you see the demeanor, the, the mindset is this. I have to strike out to have a chance. Anything less, I'm done. That's the demeanor. That's the mindset that you have to have. And so now let's go out and get it done. Let's see what happens now if I throw a four-bagger up there real quick. Let's see if I can somehow get into the mindset of Pete Weber. Yeah, and maybe throw a chop back at him. Weber, your two seed, on top by 20. Scroggins looking for player of the year honors, trying to get four in a row here in the eighth. Rope row. And a ham bone from Scroggy. And he is still alive. Pulling within 10. The pressure switches over to the PDW camp. We got us a match. Another strike for Weber. He finished fourth at the opening event of this season, the Motor City Open. Was third at the one-a-day Dick Weber Open in California and will finish no worse than second today. Looking for his first win of the season is Pete Weber. Mike Scroggins looking for his first Player of the Year title honor. Hey, Rob. Mike Scroggins can strike out to shoot 259, okay? That's ninth and tenth. If Pete Weber strikes here in the ninth, 
he's going to be in the 250s. He is a bad man today. That is huge. Pete Weber could strike out for 279, but here's the deal. Not miss. Mike Scroggins can strike out, okay, and shoot 259. Pete Weber, if he gets nine on his first ball in the 10th frame, he will lose. So Mike Scroggins strikes out ninth and 10th will force Pete Weber to get the first strike in the 10th frame to win. Anything less from Mike Scroggins, Pete Weber's gonna win title number 35. Scroggins looking for five in a row to remain alive here in the ninth. God. And leaves double wood. Oh, man. It's done. Pete Weber wins title number 35 sitting on the bench. And Weber with the title will break a tie with the legendary Mark Roth and be in sole possession of third place in the all-time Lumber Liquidator Tour title list. Title number 35 to Pete Weber, denying Mike Scroggins the Player of the Year honor. Congratulations, Walter Ray Williams, Jr. Well, I know Mike Scroggins is disappointed, and it's just this one shot right here. He had the chance, comes in a little light, leaving the 2-9. Pete could tell just by the sound of the pinfall that he just won. Yeah, the sound effects were never really there for Scroggins today. You never got that feeling like, oh, that sounded good. That was sweet. Yes, he had four in a row, five through eight, but just never really seemed to get it going. And a lot of that courtesy wow. of Pete Weber, who came blazing out of the gates here in our title match. Well, that's it. I mean, Pete, Pete got off to a red-hot start and really put it on Mike Scroggins early. Basically, he's got his foot on his throat and never let him get up or breathe. And so that was a tall order for Mike Scroggins at the start, but he did come back with that four bagger to try to make it interesting. Then Pete steps up and throws three more strikes right behind the five bagger nine spare. Spare for Scroggins. Boy, and I'll tell you what, your heart goes out to Mike Scroggins. There's so much pressure for him or anyone else coming into this title match with so much at stake and Mike never being in this position. Yes, he did win a U.S. Open. Yes, he has won a Masters. A lot of pressure that goes with winning those majors. But I don't think it's anything compared to the pressure that he felt coming into this title match. One of the real good guys in the sport, Mike Scroggins. Unassuming, calm, quiet, just a real decent person to be around. And he had that smile nice yesterday with the opportunity. But he doesn't get player of the year. It goes to Walter A. Williams Jr. as Pete Weber with the victory. Gets Walter A. Williams Jr. yet another player of the year honor. Weber in the tent. Yeah, another one. Storm is number one. Thank you, Storm. You're number one. The Weber win will give Walter Ray Williams Jr. his seventh player of the year honor. And that breaks a tie with the legendary Earl Anthony for most PBA player of the year awards. Walter Ray Williams Jr. in 86, 93, 96, 97, 98, 03, and here in 09, 10 is your player of the year. But today, Pete Weber gets his first title since March of 07, his 35th career title. Denying Scroggins Player of the Year, but getting a very emotional win. One he told us would feel like his first win ever on the tour. It's been a while since we've seen the old PDW. He was alive and well today. Congratulations, it's been a while. Tell us, 
Describe the feeling of what it's like to be back in the winner's circle. Randy, you have no idea. It feels like I just won my first title. Uh, I, I, I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. I, I got tears coming out my eyes, you know. It's just, you know, I've had that monkey on my back. And for those of you that thought I was never going to win again, take that. Does it, does it make it that much more special that you won on the oil pattern named after your father? Well, of course, Randy. It always means much more when your dad has some sort of affiliation to the tournament, whether it be the tournament pattern or the namesake. Uh, but this tournament's been great. I love the long formats. Thanks, Baltimore. I love it here. Thank you very much. And I just, I just can't say enough. Uh, wow. Uh, too bad it's the end of the year and the tournaments are done now because <laughs> I was just getting ready to go. Congratulations, Pete. Enjoy this win. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. Another title for Pete Weber, another player of the year honor for Walter Ray Williams Jr. Two winners That's today. Man. That man one in three years. and the legendary Walter Ray Andy. Williams Jr. Oh, Weber, tour title number 35. We'll be back one. to wrap it up from Baltimore after this. Bye, Tonic. Thank you, too. The Lumber Liquidators Marathon Open is brought to you by Lumber Liquidators, hardwood flooring for less. By Touch of Gray, gets rid of some gray, never all. By Golden Corral's Great American Seafood Tour, crab cakes, coconut shrimp, and tilapia, all for around 10 bucks. And by One A Day Men's 50 Plus Advantage, the multivitamin with more of what matters. What a day. For the man behind the dark glasses, PDW sharing a kiss with his wife, Tracy, getting tour title number 35 and denying Mike Scroggins Player of the Year honors. He was lights out today, Randy. Yeah, he, he really was in full control, and, he, and it, it just seemed from the onset that he was, he was here to make a statement and prove that he still has a lot left to offer this tour. PBA Experience Showdown presented by Bowl.com coming your way next Sunday live at 1 p.m. Eastern. PDW taking the title match over Mike Scroggins, 268, 224. Pete Weber wins the final event of the season. Walter Ray Williams Jr. earning Player of the Year honors for a record seventh time. For Randy Peterson and our entire crew, I'm Rob Stone. Enjoy the rest of your Easter weekend. A big win for PDW.